Hi, Vicky. How are you? Hey, Vincent. How are you? So greetings from Ireland. How are you all doing over there? Good. Not too bad now. It's snowing mad here at the moment. So I'm over at a friend's house now since the last uh, couple of days, just while the snow has been here because uh, they were given about four to six inches, which we wouldn't get at home, obviously. So, yeah, it's snowing heavy out there now again. So I'd say we'll, we'll get to six inches probably. Yeah. And how are you feeling, most importantly? Good. Yeah, I'm good. Now, I've had a few few days of feeling kind of, uh, you know, rough this week, but not what I expected. I thought now I'd be far sicker. Uh, but no, it's just been a couple of days where I've been a bit nauseous, you know, vomiting, headache, but nothing major now. So I have to say I'm, I'm delighted and better than I thought I'd be. Good, good, good. Because you look great. So uh, mm. talk about nausea. Um, I might have a little bit of that on <laughs> Thursday uh, coming up because uh, I know. The, the auction is fast um, approaching with the painting. So uh, behind, watching from behind my my hands, I'd be imagined. So. Well, I suppose what we're doing here today is we want to kind of catch up and bring people through a few different parts of the painting and about how it all came about and, you know, how the whole process went. So I suppose we might as well go back to the very beginning and uh, how it all came about. So uh, I know from my side, how it came about for me was I was talking to Mary Lee, who's the CEO of Heroes Aid and uh, who you're the patient advocate for. And uh, I was just catching up on the work I was doing and... Uh, I was talking about I was I was doing these kind of major figures in art history and thinking about doing major figures in general history, and uh, she mentioned that speaking of you know major people uh, going down in the history book, <laughs> uh, we have Vicky Phelan on the board. So I've been following your story all along anyway because you know I, I was a big big fan of, your, of what you're doing anyway. Um, being obviously a father of two two small girls, you know I was thinking she's doing Trojan work for the women of this country, uh, so. I spoke to Mary about it and I and we were speaking about how I was, how I was picturing people and I said, look, I'll paint Vicky, you know, I, I'll put my name forward and I'd love to paint her. I'd love to be able to capture um, her life story through a painting. And uh, I suppose we'll take over then to you and then how you felt when you got the call from Mary to say, there's this chap up in the middle of Offaly uh, <laughs> who's to paint a picture of you. How do you feel about it? Yeah, it was very strange, Vincent. I've been asked a few strange things over the last couple of years, but uh, being asked to paint my portrait uh, was one of the strangest now, I, I think for me, really. I, I remember my first reaction wasn't, oh my God, that's amazing. I was like, oh, I don't know how I'd feel about that. Um, I thought straight away, I just thought, oh, are people going to think, who does your woman think she is getting her portrait painted? And, you know, I, I just didn't feel really comfortable with it, to be quite honest, because I had this idea of this portrait being something kind of more stuffy do you know what I mean or more kind of posed do you know what I mean um and I kind of thought oh people are going to think I'm full of shit you know what I mean or you know too too cocky that I thought I could get my portrait painted and get it you know raising money for auction for at an auction for charity but when uh Mary in fairness she's very good she's very persuasive so she chatted to me she said no look I know Vincent really well he's an amazing artist I think you'd really like him she said, will you give him a chance? She said, will you come up and meet him up in Offaly? We're having one of our board meetings there. And I said, OK, look, I'll, I'll, I'll go and meet him, I said. But um, as you know now, uh, I did say this. Uh, I said, if he's up his own arse now, I said, I'm not doing this. I said, um, I suppose I had this idea of artists. Very cliched, really, wasn't it? Uh, my, my, my view of what artists are or what they should be. I suppose I just thought you'd be kind of somebody who was very upper class and uh maybe you know be out of touch with the reality and i i thought you know that that's not somebody who i'd kind of you know be on any level with um but then i met you and it was a totally different scenario so well will we show people the the woman behind uh yeah. persuasion not just mary we'll show people um the the woman behind the uh the the painting that kind of won you over so this is the painting of artemisia gentileschi that won you over. So this is a, uh, now we're like, we're not going to go into it uh, too much um, in the, in this particular conversation, but uh, her story is about another very incredible woman. So I suppose if you want to maybe talk about what impact this had on you and then what maybe convinced you to do it, because from, from like, you know, knowing you now the way we are and becoming fast friends, it's pretty much when you came up to Tullamore, you had, really no interest in uh in doing this it was about kind of what you've seen and what you heard so I suppose what was it that won you over Vicky 
Yeah, you know what it was? I mean, I, I remember looking at that painting when I walked into your studio and I was blown away by it, just by the colours, to be quite honest, and the and the and the 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 anatomy, sorry, you know, the fact that you painted her anatomically, I just thought, my God, that's and I didn't think, you know, like a lot of people would, I didn't think, oh, that's gross. I thought, wow, that's amazing. You know, I was looking at it all going, you know, what does that mean? Because I knew there was some meaning behind why you painted her like that. And then you said to us that you'd explain, you know, you tell us her story. And when you started telling us her story from kind of, the you know, what, ha you know, the first triptych, uh, you know, about the bed and the fact that she'd been raped and that she was a very famous painter uh, back in 17th century Italy, but she didn't get the recognition she deserved and all of the traumas that she uh, endured in her life and then how you painted the trauma into the painting. I just loved it, Vincent, to be quite honest. And I thought, yeah, do you know what? I want one like that. And, th and that was and, it and for you, me. And you, by God, you got one, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. So I just, I loved it. I loved the story behind it and the the meaning and the symbolism that you you painted into the painting, you know, and, and it just, it won me over, to be quite honest. Well, thank you, because uh, cause, uh, cause from what, um, the impression I got when you came up was that you were very open and very thing, but I suppose that's that's the problem with with conventional portraiture is that, you know, people expect a certain thing from portrait, <coughs> and then what happens is, um, you kind of get something from these portraits, I suppose, that you're not really expecting, and I think that's what really kind of I suppose hit you, and I suppose what we're trying to do in this conversation as well is to show people some of the content of what really carries over your story and what we really want to endure. You know, long after we're all gone, essentially, you know, your, yeah. your story and what you're, you're advocating for. So really, after I had uh, presented that painting to you, then was when the painting won you over, what was it kind of about the, the artist, I suppose, that won you over, essentially? Because it's a, I know I would find it very hard to hand over my personal information to somebody and say, there you go now. How did you feel about giving that over for a painting? Yeah, I, I suppose I was a bit nervous and a bit apprehensive because I had gone through a very similar process when I was writing the book. So when I wrote my book, you know, the year before, I'd had to, you know, hand over, you know, all of my diaries and my journals, you know, where I'd poured all of my thoughts and my innermost feelings into these journals over the years to somebody else, you know, to read them and to read my innermost feelings and put it on the paper. Um, and, you know, I do remember actually, you know, I had been allocated a different ghostwriter at the very beginning of the process of writing the book and we just didn't click, you know, um, and it didn't sit right with me. And I'm always somebody who goes with their gut. Uh, so I remember approaching the publisher and I thought, no, this this is not going to work. This process isn't going to work for me because I'm pouring my heart out here. This is my life story, my trauma that I'm having to relive. So I have to be really comfortable with the person who's doing that with me. So they got me another uh, ghostwriter and I, you know, I, I said, I'd be, you know, picking her myself because I wanted to be comfortable with this person. Uh, and, and that worked very well. You know, the next person they came up with, you know, we just met the first time we met, I knew it was going to work. Um, you know, I just got a good vibe and no more than yourself, Vincent, when I met you, I had a, like I said to you, I had a, a, a totally different illusion of what you'd be like. Um, and when I met you, I loved, uh, you know, straight away, I felt comfortable in your presence. I felt comfortable talking to you because you're normal. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but you're, you know, we, we're very similar. Uh, I think we come from very similar backgrounds. We're both working class um, kids from working class backgrounds uh, who've had to fight our way, you know, uh, to get where we are today. Uh, and you know you cursed as much as I do, just like a fishwife. So I love. Oh, that like a sailor, like yeah, a totally. sailor. I am, yeah. And, you know, we 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 just uh, you know we could talk all day, and that's what I loved about it. I thought, yeah, no, I I I was very comfortable with you, so I knew I'd be able to hand myself over to you, you know, and be painted. Yeah, and I suppose I have such an interest in people in general. I mean, I just love sitting and listening because I think everybody has has an experience to bring to somebody else, and mm. like I've learned so much through you and your story um, as a father, as a partner to Lynn, you know, it's, it's, it's really changed my whole outlook as well. And I mean, that's what we want this painting to do for people. The stuff that's hidden in this painting, the symbolism, we want everyone to connect with. We don't want to isolate anybody, even men, essentially. I know we, we say, you know, at the early stages, I was thinking after you agreed to do the portrait um, and I was thrilled, it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks then two weeks later. I said, you're literally representing so many women in Ireland who've been through similar experiences to Vicky, people that haven't, people that are watching from the sidelines, the men of Ireland, the nation. It was just a Trojan thing to take on. And then, of course, I had a bit of a wobble and I was kind of thinking, oh, you know, can I pull this off? 
so then I suppose the whole thing happened where I had to kind of set off on my process and that's what happened next wasn't it it was just about there yeah. you go Vincent have at it and uh, do me proud so that's when I went to work so um in regards to the kind of process I suppose um what I did was I read your memoir now before I, we met for a, a kind of more in-depth one-on-one um, I was kind of going to go into a blind and then I said, no, I think I'm going to read her memoir to understand where people are coming um, to meet Vicky from and I mean the general public. And what was great about it was, is that any kind of things that I was wondering about in the memoir and I was thinking, I wonder now what happened there. I could actually get you in front of me and say, Vicky, yeah. what happened here? And that's where you were so gracious with the information. You just gave me everything. And what that did was, it doesn't necessarily mean that, there, that everything made the painting. It meant that we could actually, I could, I could, first of all, I could deal with it with the sensitivity it needed to be dealt with, with context. So mm. when people have questions, I suppose, out in the public and they say, I wonder about this, I wonder about that. When you gave it to me, I was able to say, oh, I, that's why I, I wonder if people are interested. But then I also thought, this doesn't need to be said public aware, publicly aware or knowledgeable. So I'm going to kind of yeah. keep this to the background and we maybe hide it somewhere else in the painting or just not put it in at all. So that's where our conversations came in because we kind of really fell into each other quite naturally because we're so yeah. similar. And it just made for just really lovely conversations. And then, of course, I suppose this whack of a painting that's kind of hitting people up the side of the head all around the country um, and people are itching to know what, what's in it. So I suppose... Really, how the, the, the last part of the process before I started painting was down in Dubeg. And I suppose people are wondering how did you end up uh, getting Vicky to sit on a chair in the middle of uh, the beach <laughs> in the ocean in Dubeg? And how, how persuasive are you? So I suppose, will we tell people about kind of what happened that night in the yeah, kind of whole process? Yeah. Because maybe you take us, take us through that bit. Yeah, I suppose when we decided um, on where we put place me for this painting I suppose I always knew where I wanted it to be um, and that was in Dunbeg you know and I think it, that became quite clear to you too after you read my book yeah. because you knew that's where I wanted my ashes to be spread so Dunbeg was the obvious choice really for a lot of reasons um, for this painting but I suppose I had this vision that you were just going to go down and paint Doom, not paint Dunbeg but take photographs of the beach and then you'd paint that in do you know what I mean but I, I had no notion that you wanted me to sit on a chair in the surf with the waves lapping at my feet in in like September October, I can't even remember when it was in Dunbeg. We yeah. were just blessed with the weather, to be quite honest, weren't we? We were very lucky. And apart from the weather, I mean, I remember saying to you that day that the surf was so calm. Normally, like it's a surfing beach, so the waves are normally fairly strong and powerful. And I know I've sent you videos of the sound that you normally yeah. get there, and like it was nothing like that. The day we were there, I think it was just obviously I don't know all the stars aligned, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, big time. It was because because I had said, God, Vicky, this is a lovely beach. It's lovely and calm. And you said, it's never like this. I said, you said, uh, uh, for all the times I've been here, I have never seen the beach this quiet because as the, as the tide was coming in and, and then eventually going out, it was just lapping just nicely around you. And we have all these beautiful photographs from that, mm -hmm. that night on the beach as the sun was setting. And uh, of course, well, I'll be showing those then down the road, but uh, not just for the moment. So we, we've, and I, I also have lots of reference pictures to take as well, because I brought you into the studio and we took a few pictures for me to sketch from, which ended up one of them being your face and um, that yes. people are kind of really kind of connecting with as well. So um, then it was really all about kind of, and I mean, I still have that chair in the studio and there's still sand in the bottom of it, you know, I mean, it's still, <laughs> I still didn't clean the sand off and I'm going to keep the sand on it. Um, but then I suppose it was setting off about the painting. So I kind of went in and started thinking about how I was going to symbolically represent stuff. So because I use the human anatomy, you know, you're always running the risk of, you know, people thinking things are far too medical looking or anatomical, but that's really been your whole story, hasn't it? Yes. So Absolutely. I mean, so I mean, when when you viewed the piece first, what was your initial kind of visceral reaction to seeing that very kind of in your face imagery? You know? Yeah, I remember we had this conversation. I remember you were very nervous when you sent me your first uh, draft of it when you had me finished my painting, and uh, I remember looking at it. I suppose I was nervous about opening it because I didn't. I had an idea of what it was going to look like, and it was a bit like you know Artemisia. So I, I did expect to see my anatomy exposed like with uh, Artemisia. But what I loved about it was the softness in my face that you didn't make me look too, I think, you know, it could have looked grotesque if you, you know, for want of a better word or, or maybe a bit gruesome if my face hadn't been as soft. 
So yeah. I think the fact that my face was so soft made all the difference. Um, and I have to say, I love, you know, a few people actually said to me um, about, you know, God, you, you look naked. And I'm there, no, I'm not naked. I mean, uh, you know, what it is, is my uh, my anatomy, my insides are on show, you know? And I mean, if I'm walking around every day with clothes on, um, all of that, you know, those parts of me are, 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 are there, you just don't see them. And, and that's what I loved about it, that you're making the invisible visible. So we're all walking around with these scars, these, you know, things that have happened in our life. I mean, I love the way you painted my tumors on and then you took them off again uh, and you've painted in all the breaks in my you know, ribs and my leg and, you know, everything is there to be seen. And I love that because there are the things people don't see, you know, you break all these bones and you, you have all this damage done internally, but nobody sees that. But yet, you know, it has happened to me. And I love I love that about the painting. So it was very important for you to have the, the kids very prominent in the painting. So, I mean, that was something you were absolutely adamant on. Yes, it was for me um, because, you know, my whole story has been um, about me getting more time with my kids. You know, everything I've done over the last number of years has been to provide for my kids, you know, between taking my court case and getting, you know, a, a decent settlement out of it so that my kids are provided for. And then to, you know, researching options to give me more time with my kids. So for me, it was so important that my children are prominently placed in this portrait because they are what drive me, what motivate me, what, uh, you know, they're my reason for being, Vincent. So it was very important for me that they were represented in this painting. Yeah, and I mean, Dara, Dara's one was a little bit easier because Dara means oak in Irish. Yeah. So, I mean, that type, because even, even the shape of the sapling is kind of in the shape of a shamrock and I did that on purpose. So I yeah. wanted to make sure that it was that kind of shape to represent the Irishness of it. But Amelia was a little bit trickier because you wanted Amelia to be depicted as being independent. And we had a kind of a back and forth with that. And you kind of said, look, Vincent, I'm going to leave that to you. And I yeah. trust you with that one. So I've done her as a painted her as a crimson rosella. And the crimson rosella, this is a crimson rosella in its younger years. So the bird is generally this color, it's green and orange, which is kind of like the, the Irish flag as well, which is kind of nice as well. So it kind of ties in the Irishness of the, of the two kids. Um, but when that bird reaches maturity, it will turn into the most beautiful and vibrant red and uh, blue color. So this is very much reflecting Amelia's age as well, but the fact she's going to go on and become this more advanced and beautiful, bright bird. Um, mm. And then, of course, here we have Dara then. And then I suppose you better give your uh, your parents now mention here as well, because they're here under your hands. And these yeah. are these little trees that are kind of supporting you as well. Yeah, so my parents are represented under my hands. So it, it looks like two things, doesn't it? So it looks like there's sand going through my fingers, which is one way of looking at that. Um, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, me, my connection with the with the beach at Doombeg. But also, uh, it, well, if you look at it another way, as you said, it's trees that are growing up and they're, they're my parents like supporting my hands that are supporting my children because my parents have been there throughout everything for me uh, and my children and they'll be there you know when I'm gone so I I, I really like that uh, imagery there I think it's very important and very strong. Yeah and then of course will we talk about the colonnade here under your foot because I mean this was your uh, as well as the shamrocks <laughs> your brainchild as well because I said right Vicky I said I need some advice here so uh, that, that dispels the myth of the artist always having a huge control over what's happening and what's not happening. You know, what I like to do is I like to give it back, especially now that you're my first living sitter. You know, I said, I want to give mm. this back. So I suppose, do you want to talk a bit about the colonnade on your foot or on the bottom of your foot? Yeah, we were trying to figure out some way of representing my, uh, my fight really for justice and for accountability with my court case. Um, and, you know, I remember you uh, explaining to us with Artemisia Gentileschi, you had painted her sitting on a man, you know, you could just see the outline of a man. So it was kind of to represent her triumph over, uh, you know, men who had tried to kind of dominate her. Whereas, uh, you know, I thought, no, maybe sitting, sitting on somebody wouldn't be, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't for me. Uh, so I thought that actually that was a nice way of doing it, putting something under my foot, like as if, I, yeah, I just thought, you know, that they're under my foot, I've crushed it, you know, I won my court case uh, and I thought that was a nice way of doing it without being too in your face. Well, even the fact you're not sitting on anything in general, because I, as I, that was finishing, I said, well, I'm going to have to have her sitting on something. But if you look at it here, it doesn't yeah. look out of place. You look very much like you're self-supporting. 
And I mean, yeah. that's what you've done a lot of the way as well. I mean, you have to, had to keep yourself in exactly. check, supported, and made sure that you keep yourself as strong as you can to yeah. be the force you are in the world and across the country. So, I mean, let's, I suppose, if we look at the wider image, it's obviously dominated by the two horses. So I suppose if we talk about the first one then as well, um, I mean, obviously, we the people who've read the memoir will know the story, but there's a story of the horse chasing you um, when you're out for your walk. So do you want to talk a bit about that? Because that's a story that people are quite shocked about, you know? I know, it's a very strange story. I got chased by a horse uh, when I was out walking one day, and it really really affected me to be quite honest it affected me so much I wrote in my diary about it and I, I think I dedicated about five or six pages and I actually had read up on why would horses attack people or why would horses um you know approach somebody like that uh because it really it really unsettled me that day that this horse came right up to me and I didn't know whether he was going to attack me or whether he needed my help it really wasn't obvious um and actually what I read was that it can be one of two things. I was wearing a baseball cap. My hair was back tied back in a ponytail. And, you know, maybe he'd been abused and I looked like somebody who had abused him and, and he was trying to attack me. Or they often say that horses are very tuned in, you know, very attuned to emotions and to people's feelings. And that actually he was trying to help me because actually at the time I was going through a really bad period of depression. I was very, very, very low. And I was out for a walk to try and literally get out of my head and that the horse was actually trying to calm me. So I, I, I you know, I kind of tended to go more for that explanation because I thought it was a lovely one, um, you know, but I remember writing it in my book and people couldn't believe that this, you know, I'd had this experience. So when you kind of said to me about painting the horses in the triptych, I really liked it because I thought, you know, obviously horses, a black horse is a, a symbolism of death um, or cancer. And I thought that was a very good, um, you know, very good imagery to use for, for, for my story. And because something like that had happened to me, horses had played a big, uh, you know, part in my life. So I, I suppose um, what people uh, are, are quite astounded as well to hear is that when, when you were backed up into the corner, this horse, a car pulled up a Mini Cooper. I'll never forget you, the last was this. <laughs> Mini Cooper pulled up in the roundabout and then it was like, get into the car. So, but the horse chased you the whole way up the road, didn't he? Into, yeah, as far as it could. He, did. he chased quite a distance up the road, yeah. So he was definitely after me there was something about me that he you know he wanted or he needed or something that you know about me that bothered him so yeah it was very strange when we looked at it and the pose which I had just picked because it was a good reference um the auctioneer who's auctioned off Philip Shepherd, he went away and did some research on the the horses and he said this horse is actually not charging it's withdrawing and yeah. this added a whole different dimension to what the horse represented because this is you kind of keeping your cancer at bay as well. And, you know, where you thought cancer was going to get you, you've stopped it. And yeah. that's kind of what we want this to represent as well. So that this is in with in withdrawal is what it's called in, the, in, the, the, in that world, in the horse world. And then you move across then to the last piece and you have this white horse. And um, the white horse, so anyone who's read the memoir as well will see that the white horse has a certain reference at the end of it. Mm. But I mean, I suppose, how do you feel about this white horse and what does this mean to you? I think it can mean two things. And I think that's what we both agreed on when we were doing this bit, because I suppose I was very conscious of the fact that, you know, I didn't want this painting to be uh, sad or I didn't want people to look at it and just think of death automatically. You know, yes, you know, I, I'm very aware that I'm terminally ill and that my time is ticking. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm over here in America trying to, you know, buy some more time to spend with my children. So for me, that horse can represent one of two things. It can either be me in the afterlife, uh, looking back on my life, but looking back on my life with no regrets. You know, I've done everything that uh, I could possibly have wanted to achieve in my life. Um, I've told everybody uh, who matters to me that I love them. Um, you know, I have no regrets about, you know, the time I've spent with my children or the time I've spent with my family and the things I've done that I've achieved in my life for for other people. So, you know, I think even if I do die at the end of this, I think, you know, it still provides hope for people that, you know, even in a situation like mine, there's always hope, you know, um, but it, it can also be seen as me, uh, you know, looking across, you know, from the other side of the Atlantic, as I am now, uh, back at my family and back at Ireland and uh, hoping to come back, you know, in the very near future, please God, you know. 
Yeah, because when we spoke about the horse, I mean, there's this old adage of death rides on a pale horse. Mm. There's also these lovely connotations of Tir de Nob and the story of the white horse bringing uh, this, this really old Irish tale of of this white horse bringing Ushin across to this this land of eternal youth and bringing him and he comes back and stuff like that. So there's a lot kind of that kind of adds to it. So when you pick a general image like that, generally people will come along with their own experience and they'll kind of add on top of it as well, you know. And then yeah. I suppose we have the still life and um, really the candle has been a, a big thing for you, especially when you were leaving because of the outpouring of people are kind of lighting candles across the country for you. But the candle in this represents a, a bit more as well. Uh, mm. Because the candle really represents the fact that, you know, the brevity of life and that really, you know, all of our times can be snuffed out at once. So it's about really coming to this piece as a painting and as a story and, in, and not spending too long on it, but really moving away from it and using your experience to go on for people to live their own lives and realise that time is short yes. and our time is limited. And, you know, the horse will come for everybody eventually. Exactly. But, you know, go and live your life and go and do the things and smell the roses and eat the fruit and don't dwell too long on the negative things. Try and look at the positive things, I suppose. And that's kind of what we're, we're trying to get through with the last piece. But I suppose the thing people wonder about the most is the, uh, about the last piece is the footsteps coming off the edge. So I suppose if you could expound a bit on that. I think people would like to know as well. Yeah, I mean... The thing with footsteps in sand is, you know, as soon as you've walked in the sand and the tide comes back in, they wash it washes away your footsteps. So there's no trace of them. And I always love that about sand, the way, it, you know, it washes away everything and everything is clean again afterwards. And um, so, you know, even though people may not be able to see me and my footsteps will be washed away by that tide that was coming in, uh, you know, it doesn't mean I'm not there. Um, I'm still there in spirit. Uh, and that's that, you know, whether I'm alive or dead, I mean, at the moment, nobody at home can see me because I'm over here in America. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's a nice way to end the painting because yes, my footsteps are walking off the canvas, but you know, that doesn't mean I'm not there. Um, you know, I'm either in the afterlife when I do pass away or I'm over here, hopefully trying to find a cure, you know, um, but you know, just because people aren't present uh, and, and I think we've also found that through COVID because we haven't been able to see our families or friends. It doesn't mean they're not there you know that we're always there to help each other and and that's I suppose the way I've been with my life you know yeah and the beauty of the painting is is that those footsteps are there forever there ain't no washing those away Vicky I mean when exactly, it comes to the painting, yeah. there ain't no washing away and even <laughs> uh, even the fact that there's when when we had had our um finished up we would what we walked along the beach and we were talking um just about what we were expecting with the painting and what was going to where it was going to end up and stuff and i mean i took some sand from the beach and mm. uh, there's actually sand from dune bag mixed into the paint so when you run your hands across this not that i encourage everyone when they see it to run their hands along the painting uh, <laughs> but if you were to run your hands along this painting and you can actually see it from the side um you can see it in some of the painting here it's actually textured yes with the, with the with the paint exactly. so dune bag is in that piece yeah, you know, as are you, and um, I suppose what we want as well. I mean, we talked about where it was going to end up. Where do we want the painting to end up? Where do you want the painting to end up, um, long term? Um, well, obviously, because I've been so public about everything about my story, about you know what I've shared. You know, for me, ideally, I'd love the painting to end up somewhere public, in a gallery or in some medical, you know institution you know on show for people so that it will be available to for people to see you know far and wide that it wouldn't end up necessarily in some private collector as painting you know collection where it's just in somebody's house i would love it to be bought by either a big conglomerate or you know some very wealthy person who might donate it to a public um space where people would be able to see it because you know i've been so public about everything else in my life i think it would be lovely if the painting was public as well yeah, me too. I mean, we really want people to be able to go and access this painting yeah. and be able to take what they want from it, because we have to also be prepared for the fact that even though there's a narrative that goes through the whole lot, and we've only spoken about a tiny bit of the symbolism in this, because it's chocked full of even more symbolism than we could even go through in, in, a, in, a, in a book, really, you know, it would be a book's worth. Um, but we want people to kind of remember what happened. Mm. And I mean... That's what I realized when I took this on is that I'm earmarking a landmark moment in Irish history, medical history as well. And, I, 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 you know, I mean, a, a nice perspective that somebody gave me was is he uh, was a GP and he said, um, 
look, when I was studying, uh, if I had had a painting like this in the, the place where I was studying medicine, I can tell you for one, it would have a profound effect on me and I would make sure that what happened to Vicky Phelan would never happen to patients under my care. And I suppose that brings us then nicely to frontline workers and what they're all doing during this current pandemic that we're all sharing. And I mean, mm. that goes back to your role as patient advocate in Heroes Aid. And I mean, my, my want to do this painting was to do you proud and make sure that your story was told in an honorable and you know meaningful way. And then I suppose to benefit frontline workers, which is where the funds for this painting are all going to go because you know, you've had so much um, medical history at this stage. Yeah. It's just lovely to be able to give something back because I know that all I can do is paint and it's all I'm good at, it's all I know how to do. But these people are on the front line that are gonna keep me alive if I do contract COVID-19. Um, so it's really kind of my honoring of these people as well and of your story to bring it all in together, you know, because this painting will outlast all of us, not just you, not just me, it's gonna outlast everybody. So we wanna make sure that everybody knows what the intent of the piece was and that how much we appreciate all the people on the front line as well. Absolutely. Yeah, no. I mean, that's why when I was asked um, about this portrait, uh, you know, I'd never have just had a portrait done of me for for just, you know, to have one um, when it was made clear to me that, you know, they wanted me to have it done so that the funds would be donated to ch the charity to Heroes Aid for frontline workers. I was totally on board because, you know, it's for a higher purpose. You know, that's exactly it, isn't it? What we are doing, you and me, you give up your time and your paint and you know months of your life really to do this and to get into my head uh, and I gave up my you know my life and my you know sat for this portrait for you but we're doing it for a higher purpose you know we're doing it to help other people and I think that's very important and art and I think art has kind of been hijacked and I mean this kind of goes back because we'll finish up with this and um, mm. it kind of goes back to the preconceived notions of what art is and what it isn't and I suppose my higher purpose is to show people that art can do so much more than just visually stimulate you. When you come to a painting, I mean, we can show with this painting that I can tell your life story. And what I want to do, I suppose, from my side is to kind of challenge convention about what painting can and can't do. Because, I mean, I know from the early stages, you said the kids now have my memoir and they have this painting. Yeah. And you can go and visit this painting when, when, when it gets public and you can just consume it in 10 seconds. You can consume it in half an hour or 10, 10 minutes. That's the beauty of painting. And that's mm -hmm. why I really hope that I've done you really proud of this because it was a big task for me. It was a huge honor for me um, because this work is quite new. I mean, I've only been doing this for about two and a half years, these triptychs. So for you to trust me with this was an incredible, incredible honor. And I just hope I knocked it out of the park for you. You absolutely did, Vincent. You more than knocked it out of the park. I mean, you not only impressed me, you impressed my mother, which is not a very uh, easy feat, I can tell you that much. Like, I mean, yeah, Irish <laughs> you know, I mean, my parents, my dad was in tears when he saw this. Honestly, when I sent him the photo of the painting, he was absolutely in tears. He just thought it was absolutely amazing. He loved it. Um, and, and like they like again, they haven't seen the proper painting, you know, they haven't seen it. So it would be lovely for them to see it in real life. And that's why it would be lovely if it was donated so that it was available somewhere where we could all go look at it publicly, you know. Um, I think it would be lovely for everybody to have access to it. Well, Vicky, an absolute pleasure as always. Um, thanks for taking the time to, to, to bring people through this. And uh, like, I know I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for myself but from everybody else as well. We're just all sending just mountains and mountains of good vibes. And I, I said before the plane left that the, the, all the well wishes of this country could have flown that feckin' plane. I know, and I'm you telling you. Yeah, I believe it. And you know what? Um, it's been fantastic. I don't think we kind of give ourselves enough of a pat on the back, um, Irish people, that, uh, you know, we're so good at getting behind somebody and getting behind a cause. And, you know, they really have gotten behind me. So it's been fantastic. And none more so than you now, Vincent, to be quite honest. I mean, you've done, uh, you know, a huge amount of work there, uh, you know, with three young kids uh, to do this for no uh, payment. So I really hope that, uh, you know, that this will help to you know get loads of commissions for you going forward and that you'll become very well known and and uh, very expensive because then I'll, I, I'll get great comfort from that to know that uh, you know you've made it in the art world so yeah thank you oh well Vicky thanks and listen I'll talk to you soon okay yeah exactly no bother talk to thanks, you soon Vicky. bye, bye.